Why, hello there. Yes, good morning and welcome to St. Peter's Second Letter. Here we are. Look at this. We're going through a good chunk today. Good chunk in Second Peter. Let's start with a prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, remind us always that you need to guard us from false teaching. Call all people to repentance by your pure word. We ask that you strengthen our faith today and that you humble us, that we might receive your mercy and so have peace. We ask this in your holy name. Amen. Yes, well, here we are, Second Peter, my goodness. So far, Peter has told us that, in fact, right in the church, standing right at the doors, as you head in there, are these uh, false teachers, even s preaching from pulpits, uh, denying the same Lord they, they claim to be proclaiming. And last time we specifically looked at, this, at uh, those ways that preachers deny Jesus. Uh, go watch the other video from uh, earlier parts of Second Peter if you want to see those, what they are. But here Peter's calling those false teachers to repent. He's warning them of eternal destruction. You see, preachers are held to a higher account, and they're threatened with greater punishment because their influence, well, uh, it's a bit more widespread. So, Peter's not going to mince words here. Let's see what he says today. Talking of the false teachers, he says, But these, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction, suffering wrong as the wage for their wrongdoing. It's intense. Yeah, this picture, I like, I like this. It, the picture, this, how does he picture them? Irrational animals. It's kind of like, um, like, I like to think of like a wild, like a mad elephant. You know, something that, that is just, you know, when the elephant loses it and it's just going crazy. And here, let's give him a little tail there, poor little guy. He's, he sees red and off he goes. There's no, there's no saving yourself when he's on a rampage. People uh, are in big grave danger when the mad elephant is uh, going crazy. You're going to see that madness coming up down here. But this is going to tie in. You're going to see that in a sec here. But the mad elephant, I want, that's how I want you to picture the, that Peter is describing these false teachers. This is not an obedient dog. These are irrational, dangerous, unpredictable, and unfought, unfit. The only, the only thing you can do with a mad elephant is catch it and destroy it. Because they are destructive and they're hurting others with their false teaching. Peter says, look, they will be destroyed in their destruction. So they, the, the rampage that the elephant is on is, de is destructive and hurting people. But they also, the false, these false teachers, will be destroyed with their, in their own destruction. The mad elephant is destroyed along with those that it hurts, uh, Peter is saying. And it's very sorrowful. Um, now listen, it's amazing, this call to repentance. He, this is, he doesn't want them to be destroyed. He's telling them, take a hard look. You, those that presume to teach in the church, use that prophetic word to measure yourself, to, to purify your teaching very important. He goes on for a whole chapter about it. Uh, obviously, quite important. Now, I like this part too. The wage. Suffering wrong as the wage. You see, they, they think they're going to profit. The false teachers in, in their delusion think. And it looks like in the world here, oh, they're, they're, you're, you know, things are going well. But God's going to defraud them. He's going to pay them back, Peter says. And it's going to be with suffering for all of this rampaging that their teaching has done. Though it looks semi-good here in the world, look, they count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. They're not, they're not ashamed of this. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions while they feast with you. A reference to the Lord's Supper. Look at this. How in the church are these ones? They are feasting with you, these ones. Right? These are, these are deep deep seated Luther Luther said these this is the the papacy and and the false teachings of the Pope um, that certainly would apply in this this group of false teachers but there are that's not the only ones 
Now, look what it says here. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. And these, of course, are the ones that are new to the word. They don't know the whole word. So their walk is brand new. They're a little, they're like toddlers in the faith, right? Little recent converts, um, which there were many in the early church. And they're unsteady in their, their, these souls, these poor souls, and they entice them away. They entice them away. They have hearts trained for greed. Look at the words, greed, uh, entice, adultery, revel. These are all very, it's about the heart. You can see what's happening here. There's a lot of um, the heart, the hearts of these false teachers are drawn to what helps them personally. And they are causing a toddler, toddlers in the faith to, to stumble, accursed children, forsaking the right way they have gone astray. So they used to, they used to know the right way. These are, these are teachers who at one time knew the gospel. They have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing. Love gain, there's another one, greed, love gain, entice, rebel, but was rebuked in it for his own transgression, a speechless donkey spoke with human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. This is Numbers 22, the height of all irony, isn't it? Don't you love this? I get to draw all these animals. First, it was a, uh, first it was a, <laughs> a elephant there, and now look at this, we got, you remember Balaam? So he was going to go, he was going to go declare a, uh, a curse on, uh, on God's people. And God came to destroy him. And uh, he's riding his donkey. And of course, the donkey, donkey sees the, the angel in Numbers 22. You want to check it out. And it, it's, it's, it's a grim thing. The donkey's trying to get away, trying to help his, his master and uh, his, his ride get away from this, uh, this pending situation. And of course, uh, Balaam starts to, to beat him. Starts hitting his donkey. Come on, donkey, do what I want it. I want you to do. And the donkey's just trying to. And eventually, the donkey like turns around, and he starts to talk. And he says, "What are you crazy?" And of course, uh, it's the height of all irony because the prophets, this uh, this Balaam, starts to argue with him. No, and he's they're having this this exchange here. Uh, meanwhile, pride, and that's certainly the case with with Balaam. You know. It's loving wrongdoing and loving gain and all this. This pride is crazy. And this is all showing you. Look what the reason that Peter's using this example. It's he's saying, Do you, are you crazy? Are you going to be proud about this? We must all be humbled. Lord, bring us to nothing that we may all receive from you. Lord in mercy. Madness. All of this false teaching is utter Madness. He's not going to ease off, though. Peter's not going to ease off. These are waterless springs and mists driven by a storm. In other words, there is no life in the ministry of these false teachers. There's, there's no, nobody's thirst is being quenched. There's no gospel here. And they're mists. That is to say, they, they lack substance. They are... Here and gone tomorrow, their teaching is, is worthless. Um, and contrast that uh, with the Lutheran confessions, which, you know, we celebrated 500 years uh, in 2017, all based on the word, not really missed, is it? Exactly. Lord of mercy, nonetheless. For them, the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved, these false teachers. Uh, they think things are going so well right now. They live well but an eternal darkness will come upon them. For speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. Um, this is good. We, can, we, got, we got the kind of the dark world of, of paganism out of which, you know, the, the, the early church is being called. And these, and these recent converts who have just kind of cross the line and they've, they've, they've entered um, down the path of, of Christianity. And who's meeting them right there? Right at the, is, is, these, is these false teachers. They're meeting them and they have this, 
they have this this message to them that that is more or less like oh you can kind of go back and dabble in the paganism you can go back into into the into these sensual passions of the flesh you know these they're barely escaping they've just come out and uh, from those who live in the era of paganism and and yet look these false teachers are already leading them astray the false teachers promise them freedom but they themselves are slaves of the corruption for whatever overcomes a person to that he is enslaved for if after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ like come out they are again entangled in them and overcome. The last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. Yeah, how much of the church, now this is a very intense question for you and I, how much of the church stands there today and says, sexuality of all kinds? not a problem go back into it join the paganism of the world that's the church saying that this is not stuff from outside the church there are major sections of the church the liberal church and otherwise saying yeah go back into the into the into the sexual passions listen to your flesh you don't have to fight your flesh lord have mercy they, these false teachers are not good role models look at did you see this they are not the ones. They're consumed by greed and lust and sensuality themselves. And look at this. If you knew, uh, if you had known the way of righteousness, it would have been better if you didn't know it than after knowing it to turn back. In other words, if you, if you turn around here and head back, it's worse than if you had never come out. If you had just stayed in paganism, that would have been better. But now it's going to be worse. I mean, Jesus said the same thing in Luke chapter 11, didn't he? Listen, it's possible to lose your faith. Don't lose your faith. Don't lose your faith. Lose yourself. Trust the word. This is, this is, the word is calling you out of this, out of all that. Repent. Get back on the path. And the path, by the way, is the path of repentance. It's not the path of righteousness. It's, it's not the path of, of um, never sinning. The way of righteousness is the way of repentance in Jesus. It's a, it's a way that has been, that has been, the, blood, the shed blood of Jesus is, is, covers this path. And the only way you get on it is by, re, by repentance and faith. Lord, have mercy. Because look what happens here. Look at this. This description of, of turning back, he's going to give us some disgusting pictures of this. Look at this. What the true proverb says has happened to them, these ones who've turned back. The dog returns to its own vomit. Now, I know that's not very pleasant oh my goodness this doggy is um he's going back to that his the pile of the pile of, of wretchedness that he just hacked up what is he doing this is an awful idea um but this is the picture right how does this happen the dog returns to his own vomit you know you know finally got rid of whatever was not supposed to be in there don't go and put it back in you. This is unbelief we're talking about. You finally got finally got the unbelief out. Keep it out. Oh, keep. In fact, the more of it that you can get out, the better. Lord have mercy. Don't go back. Put it in the pagan lifestyle. This whole paganism, the whole life of unbelief, is vomit, and you need to view it like that. It, it's what shouldn't have been in you in the first place. Now. There's a second picture. That's the first picture. Oh my goodness. There's a second one. It's not, it's not any prettier, by the way. It's the sow or the pig um, who, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mire. What was the point of the washing? Notice the washing. The washing, of course, is connecting with the baptism, right? The baptized, and you come out of paganism. No more sexuality and sensuality and fleshliness and greed and lust. You're fighting it now. That's the path of, of the way of righteousness, is fighting against that. But if the sow, after being baptized, returns to wallow in the mire, oh my, don't go down into unbelief. Don't go down into the unbelief uh, mire. It is, it is death and vomit and, and filth. Yeah, that's what Peter's saying. Whoa. 
He doesn't mince words. I promised you. He doesn't mince words. Here we go. Now in chapter 3, he says now, listen, beloved, beloved, this is not the second letter I'm writing to you. In both of them, I'm stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember. You see that? How important is it for you to remember the way, the truth, and the light? How important is it for you to keep the prophetic word, the way of repentance and faith in front of you? Oh my goodness. Uh, that you should remember, now watch what he does here, the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord Jesus through your apostles. He connects, by the way, in one of the only places in scripture, prophets and apostles, uh, the Old Testament and the New Testament, and puts them on the same level of authority, both inspired. Thanks be to God that he said that through Peter. Now, so remember, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Remember the word. He said, he said keep remembering the word, as he said before. Knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. You see this, um, this scoffing unbelief This uh, has, has a couple of characteristics. Mockery, unbelief mocks the word and mocks the message. Cynicism, you're going to see here in a second. And then, well, look at this, following their own selfish desires, we've got self-indulgence. Now, if that doesn't describe the the world of unbelief today and pagan, I don't know. I don't know what does. But so he, Luther said, Luther said, in chapter one was the time of the pure gospel, and chapter two was uh, the time of the pope and the and the false doctrines of within the church, and and in in chapter three, which is what we still we've entered in now, is just people will believe nothing, nihilism, and they'll just they'll just be lost entirely. Well, Luther, if you, and he said it, he actually said it was happening in his day. Luther, if you only knew, if you could only see what we're facing today, Lord have mercy. Okay, so, verse 4, he says this. He scoffers, this is what they will say. Where is the promise of his coming? That is his second coming, his return. Jesus is. Forever since the fall, fathers fell asleep, that is to say, there are apostles who are dead now, uh, Peter, not quite, but some of the apostles have been martyred, right? Ever since the, the apostles, the fathers, have fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. Come on now, I thought he was going to come back. Where was Jesus? Where is he going? And they imagine here, look, the beginning of creation. They imagine, these scoffers, that Christ's coming will not end the created order. Right? So all the things that are in order and the way that they're ordered, they think, oh, come on. Christ's going to, he's either not going to come back or it's not going to matter. It's not going to change anything. But look, for these scoffers deliberately overlook this fact that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God, creation. Right? That's the creation account, Genesis 1. And that by means of these, that is the water and the word working together, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. He's talking, of course, about Genesis 6, the flood. Right. So they're forgetting these scoffers. Look at, does this sound like the unbelief in mockery and cynicism and self-indulgence of today? They forget the creation and the flood. Yeah. So he says, listen, by the same word, the heavens and the earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. God's going to intervene. He's done it before, Peter says. Look, he did it. they forget he did it already. He has completely changed things. He's completely intervened and he's warning that he's going to do it again. Repent. Prepare your hearts. Get ready now. Because the flood, no one knew the flood was going to come. Boom, they should have. No one was telling them. But the ungodly will be judged. Look, so there's judgment, just like judgment of the ungodly, just like in the flood. And there'll be deliverance of the faithful. So there'll be a distinction made between the ungodly and the faithful. And this, of course, is what we say in the right rite of holy baptism. 
separating them from the multitude of unbelievers, right? Keeping them in the holy ark of the Christian faith in the church, right? The one thing that will be different, of course, is that it will not be water. Nope. At his second coming, it will be fire. Now Peter's going to tell us why. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. In other words, God does not experience time the way you and I experience time. It's like for the Lord, he's saying, all time is present right before him at the same time. So the Lord sees one day and a thousand years uh, in the same way. And now this is not a formula, by the way. This is not some sort of mathematical formula for figuring out when he's coming. No, his point is repent. It could be any time. This could be our last hour. Well, then why is God waiting? The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you. We've got to definitely underline that. His slowness, his, pa his patience. See this? And it's not towards somebody else. It's towards you. Not wishing that any should perish. God doesn't want anyone to die. But that all should reach repentance. This is the reason. This, this is, this, we got to highlight this the most. Lord have mercy, repentance. This is the big focus of the Lord. He's trying not to destroy. He desires salvation. Now, repentance has two parts. First, that we have sorrow over sin. That's, that's what the law does, right? This, this message of, of, of law makes us sad and, and saddened, uh, sorrowful that we, that we are sinners. It's true. It's a sad thing. But that's not the only part of repentance. Repentance has two parts. And the second part is faith. That is trusting Christ's forgiveness and that it's for you, that he actually is declaring it um, to you. So we turn from sin and we turn to Christ. And this is, of course, the message of the gospel, that you trust that it's promised this word is for you. So this repentance is what causes the delay. The Lord is not slow. He's patient towards you that you might repent and be in this cycle of law and gospel and so grow up in your faith. Thanks be to God. Oh my goodness. Because look at this. Just in case you thought there was a formula up here, Peter, make sure you, you know there isn't one. Look. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. And then the heavenly heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Now, I'm an, a thief. This is the picture that we're given. I'm bringing the thief out here. Um, the thief does not want you to know when he's coming. Um, he is a sneaky guy. He comes uh, hidden. He is deliberately trying not to be discovered. And so the idea that you're going to figure out when he's coming, you're going you're gonna to calculate the day, is absolutely uh, is foolish. The Lord is going to sneak up on you, is what Peter is saying. Um, yeah, let's put, make him a beard. A bearded thief is scarier than a non-bearded thief, wouldn't you say? So um, here comes this thief, and he is definitely going to, sneak up on you. You are not, you're not going to uh, outwit him. And when you least expect it, he's not going to be noticed. It's supposed to be a surprise. So don't try and figure it out. Repent. Get ready now. Because look, did you get, did you catch this? That instantaneous surprise will be fire everywhere burned up and dissolved. Just instant fire everywhere. Um, I don't know how to draw that because that's terrifying. 
but it's supposed to get us to prepare now. There's no moment to repent then. Um, everything's going. Now the heavenly bodies, that would, be, that would even include the sun, the moon, uh, and the stars. What are those? Those are the things by which we measure time. That's right. It's all, the whole created reality, space and time, all exposed. Everything Stop because of Christ's second coming, Peter says. And then, of course, the earth and the works done on it will be exposed. This fire is going to, you what, you thought the clothing was going to keep God from seeing. No, we're going to end up, everything's going to end up naked again, and everything will be um, nothing hidden. Not thoughts, not desires, nothing. That's why Peter calls all to repent and get ready now. Now oh, here we go, let's finish it off. So since all these things are thus to be was dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? Thank you, Peter. If you believe this, then what? Yeah, exactly. If you trust that this is the case and you trust the word of God, you should be so set on uh, a life of holiness and godliness. Get rid of whatever else is in your life that's not focused on this. It does not belong. This fire is a purifying fire. It could happen any moment. Change your life right now, Peter is saying. God is going to fulfill his promise. Look what's happening. Since these are, this is the kind of people you are, you believe this. You're waiting for and hastening the coming day of God because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. Watch the promise, but according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. New, a new reality, a new created order with new heavens and new earth and no sin, no death, no devil, just righteousness. And so therefore in it, the love of God, shared and, and circulated by all of God's people, this is what we long for. This is the thing he is, is working for with the whole plan, is the newness, uh, a communion, a, us in his presence and him in our presence all the time. You believe it? Get ready. Start living it like it's, like it's the case now, Peter says, because it could be any moment. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, have mercy. Clean up our faith. Burn away everything that's in the way and help us to walk in repentance with you all our days. Set our eyes chiefly by what we believe on these lives that should be holy and godly before you and clear away now by this word everything that's in the way of that. Help us to pursue that more and more and, and we ask that you move us by your spirit in this way. Use that word and spirit of yours to work in our lives so that we would be ready. You're the one making us ready. We can't do it. You do it by the word like you've done just now. Continue to do that in us. In your name we pray. Amen. Wow. Okay, well, one little section left. We'll do that next time. Just like 14 to the end of the chapter. But you got it tonight. Wow. It went from day to night and back again. One day, a thousand years. God bless you.